In this presentation, I'll be talking about multimedia learning, information processing theory, cognitive load theory, and I'll be giving you some techniques um, to, to use when developing multimedia learning opportunities or learning environments uh, that can help counteract some of the issues within uh, how we learn with multimedia. Information processing theory, uh, as opposed to behaviorism, which says that the environment shapes how we learn, Information processing theory says we control how we learn. It's all about our own cognition. And lots of people liken this to computing. So there's a lot of different inputs into the computer or our uh, cognition. The inputs are akin to sensory memory. Uh, they get imported into the computer or like our working memory, short-term memory. And then we store it in our long-term memory just like you can store things on a hard drive, uh, external hard drive or USB drive. So we'll be looking at these. You can see uh, in the presentation itself there's a clickable link on a, a really good article on working memory and it gives you a lot of ways um, to really promote effective use of working memory in your students. Sensory memory is massive. Uh, there's so many things in our environment that come into our brains whether we know it or not. Uh, the sound of the hum of the air conditioner in the classroom. Most of us don't really notice that until somebody says, hey, that's a pretty loud hum. Uh, um, or seeing the trails of a sparkler. So that's just a memory. It's not really trails of fire. It can be visual, auditory, olfactory, all kinds of things that come into our brain. It's really not until we pay attention to it that we notice it. And that's when it moves into our working memory. That's what we have to realize. We have to get the student's attention before we can do, or before any kind of learning can occur. And this might sound obvious, uh, but it can't be understated. And you can see the last slide for seven automatic attention getters. It's pretty good information to have. The working memory, this is where our learning occurs. This is where cognition happens. Unfortunately, most of us don't know how to do this properly. Uh, we have to be taught how to learn effectively. That means learn some new information, attach it to existing or prior knowledge, and that way the learning becomes sticky. Okay, so this is an active type of memory. Um, unfortunately, most people tend to just repeat things to learn, and that's not a good method of learning. You know, repeating a phone number over and over and over or vocabulary words and their definitions, just repeating over and over. It's not doing anything. It's not connecting to existing knowledge, uh, which then gets encoded into our long-term memory. Uh, the problems with this, which we'll talk about, is that the working memory is limited in terms of the capacity and the length of time that we have to, uh, to do this thinking. So we encode this new information by attaching it to old information. Uh, and we retrieve long-term memories um, when we're thinking and, and trying to attach old information. So it works both ways. Um, the long-term memory typically is passive until we need it. Then we go into it and recall the information. Um, an example of attaching existing knowledge to, to new knowledge is when we're learning mathematical order, oper order of operations, most of us have learned, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. So mnemonic devices are really good to help us uh, keep things under control and make it easier to learn. Um, in terms of long-term memory, the capacity is huge. Uh, we can remember tons and tons of things and it just gets stored. Sometimes we don't really remember how to access this information, though. It doesn't just disappear. We just kind of forget how to access it. The sensory me memory, enormous. Again, so much information is entering this, this sensory memory, <clears throat> but it goes away really fast. Like, think about those sparkler trails. Really quickly, they go away. Um, in our working memory, typically, uh, people can hold seven plus or minus two pieces of information. Uh, we, unfortunately, don't have much time before this information decays. That's why we repeat that phone number over and over and over and over. 
And then long-term memory, again, it's enormous. An example of this is uh, Rain Man, if you've ever seen that movie. It's based on a real guy, and apparently researchers found out he, even though he remembers everything, only uses 8% of his long-term memory. And this lasts forever, basically. We don't really, it doesn't lose, our long-term memory doesn't lose information. It's just the pathways to access the, uh, the information sometimes gets fuzzy and, and we forget how to remember. According to information processing theory, there are two ways to receive information. One is through the audio channel, your ears, uh, and the other is through the visual channel. So this would include pictures and text. <clears throat> Going back to the, uh, the storage and the, the, the limitations of working memory, Miller in the 50s had this really famous experiment where he found that, again, about seven elements can be stored at any one time in the working memory. As interesting, or maybe more so, uh, more recent information or research has shown that we can only process two or three elements. This is why it's so hard to do, like let's say, long division in our head because it's a lot of information at once. Uh, so what do we do about these limitations? Well, there are several techniques. And we'll start with Richard Mares. Um, he's a, f a famous educational psychologist that studies cognition and multimedia. The multimedia principle says that people learn from better or learn better from words and pictures than from words alone. So this is why we have and textbooks have so many graphics. Uh, infographics are really good for this. Uh, it just helps when you're seeing a simulation and you see images with it. It makes more sense than just seeing text. So whenever we can, we want to integrate visuals. Here's an example. Oh, this is actually a different one. <laughs> My mistake. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing is that we want to do this. Th again, this sounds obvious. However, it doesn't happen all the time. But you want to put text near the corresponding part of the picture. And doing so reduces the need for, for scanning. So if on the left-hand slide, if I'm reading through the text, and I come to the word nucleoli or nucleolus, I have to kind of stick what that text is saying. I have to keep that in my working memory. And then I have to keep it there as I look up and look for the word nucleolus in the graphic. So I have to scan at the same time as holding stuff in my working memory. Versus the slide on the right, um, you can see that the, on the right, the nuclear envelope begins to break into fragments. Well, I don't have to really do any scanning. I have uh, the, the text is right there, um, and there's a little cue, of an arrow, that says where I should be looking. Same with this math problem. There's uh, two steps in solving this issue, this angle, finding the angle. And if I start reading the solution on the left-hand slide, uh, I read it and I have to hold that in my memory, my working memory, as I look up and try to find the proper angle that I'm, you know, the relevant angle, versus the one on the right. Step one, right there. I know what angle I'm looking at and and I see how to solve it. All right, I want I want you to do something here, and I want you to be honest and do this the right way. I want you to try to memorize this. I'm gonna, I just want you to take 30 seconds, no more. So I want you to pause this, take 30 seconds, and try your best to remember this. Don't write it down, just use your head. So 30 seconds, ready? Go. Okay. Okay, we're back now, and I want you to set that number aside for a second and count the number of times the hamsters go around the wheel. Okay, so what was that number? Can you remember it? Well, I only spent about 15 seconds on that last slide, but if you weren't thinking about that number, trying to keep it in your memory, if, if you got distracted, then you probably lost it. Um, there it is. Okay, this brings up something called chunking and segmenting. Okay, it's the same thing, um, different words for the same thing. Basically, if we take a lot of information, we want to take small parts 
and feed it to the learner uh, as opposed to giving them this huge amount. Okay, uh, some of you probably recognize these numbers, but if I segment these, these are actually being segmented into things that we know. So this is really easy to remember now because we already have prior knowledge. We, don't, we can just store these information. We don't have to process. We don't have to repeat. Columbus, uh, emergency, and so on and so forth. The same could be said about PowerPoint slides or uh, other, other presentations that have just a ton of text. It's better to provide bullet points and then elaborate on it. If we, if we have a slide like this, it's just so much information. We want to give it to them in uh, more palatable spoonfuls, I guess. Uh, this also brings up another point. If, if I ask you um, to read this, if this is my slide, and I put it up, and I start reading this, well, probably you're already going to have started reading this, and I might be reading faster than you, so I might catch up to you, or I might be re reading slower than you, um, so I'll be reading some things uh, in the beginning, and you're going to be in the middle, and there could be some dissonance there. So we want to avoid presenting the same uh, information in printed and spoken words. It's better to do it just spoken words alone. Uh, so this guy, you might be wondering what Nostrich is doing here. Well, nothing really. He's distracting you, and this is bad. You're not thinking about the content. You're thinking about, hey, that's a funny-looking ostrich. So we want to actually eliminate things that are interesting but extraneous to the material. So sound effects in PowerPoint or just silly images that don't really relate to anything. We want to avoid these. Um, another thing, better learning occurs when words are presented as narration and not on-screen text. So this is why narrated slideshows uh, with something like VoiceThread, which we'll look at, um, are really superior to PowerPoints with just text. Also, when we're presenting information, it's much better to do it informally, um, in a conversational tone, rather than the stuffy, formal style. Uh, this, this probably makes sense if you think about it. It puts the learner at ease, um, especially if it's the teacher and the student knows the teacher and knows the way they normally talk. If all of a sudden you're creating a, a slideshow that has a very formal, you're, uh, you're speaking in a formal tone and you don't normally do that in class, well, hmm, it might make the, the, the student think, why is he talking like this or why is she talking so formally? Lots of different multimedia uh, tutorials and, and, and learning opportunities through YouTube especially. YouTube, I, I think I've said, in a, is the youth's most preferable search engine. And it's the second most popular search engine on the internet. Uh, when we produce tutorials or when we produce learning uh, environments that are multimedia based. We can do it with a number of ways. We could do it through YouTube. Uh, Jing and Screencast-O-Matic, which the latter of which I'm using right now, creates uh, these screen capture videos for free. Uh, Show Me is a great free app for the iPad and you can, if you have the presentation available, you can click on that Show Me graphic and you can see an example of this uh, that my son who was in kindergarten at the time did really easy to use. Anybody can use it, a kindergartner um, and a teacher alike. So there are ways to do this and um, hopefully you'll take advantage of, of these types of things or, or digital storytelling like voice thread. They're really good for learning and hopefully you consider some of these techniques that we look through as you are creating them. And lastly, here are the seven ways to automatically get attention.